Hello. <laughs> Thanks for that. Hello. The video. Anybody else want to just shout out, like, say random words? <laughs> Hello. Hello. And welcome back. This is another lesson. I'm not going to give a number to it because I've lost count. But it is a lesson about the cornerstones of civilization. What we've done today is we've looked at many case studies in the ancient globalized world. And from them, we're trying to see some of their social, political, cultural, economic, and religious cornerstones. And then ultimately, what we want to do from this is see which of these cornerstones would be the cornerstones we'd like to create our civilization around. So after I'm done reviewing what we've seen, after we're, we're done reviewing what, what uh, we've, we've viewed together, I'll give you a chance to try to prioritize them and say, that's the kind of ideal society I'd like to live in. Creating an ideal society is a big part of Social Studies 30, and uh, here in 10, we are trying to preload some of the content so that 30 is more um, palatable for you. So, we're going to begin with the Neolithic Revolution. Now, you may remember that Hip Hughes told us that the Neolithic Revolution happened for uh, potentially many different reasons. We can't say for certain which one, but one of the reasons could be because of climate change. That the end of the Ice Age changed the livability of certain areas, opening up some pockets to uh, being able to maybe sustain larger numbers, and also the animals may have uh, ended up migrating. So with the change in climate came resulting change in living circumstances that may lead to the ability for people to live in larger numbers. Another possibility was population change. Now, no doubt population change was connected to climate change, but with population change came opportunities for more cooperation. He also promoted the feast theory, the idea that they early in the Neolithic Revolution, keeping in mind the revolution wasn't one day or one month, but over hundreds and hundreds of years, maybe even thousands of years, uh, the Neolithic Revolution, one theory of why it started about 12,000 years ago, is some of the tribes discovered that there truly was strength in numbers, that uh, there was an advantage living in, in larger populations, and that led to more permanent settlements. Other theories about the Neolithic Revolution included the Oasis Theory. And the Oasis Theory meant that there were only a few livable pockets, and these became the cradles of civilization. So we often talk about uh, the Middle East and Mesopotamia, Babylonia, in between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers of current day Iraq. We talk about Syria. We talk about the Nile in Egypt. We talk about uh, the Indus Valley in present-day Pakistan and India. We talk about the Mississippi here in North America, and obviously the great rivers of China. Now, when we look back to the Neolithic Revolution, we can see some of the building blocks of modern civilization. If you look back to Syria, you can see the domestication of animals. That's a positive, because now we have control over part of our food source, but the neat thing with social studies is that not everything's just a positive or a negative. So in mathematics, you know, 2 plus 2 is 4. But here in social studies and in social sciences, there's nuances attached to these changes. So the domestication of animals brought about you know, some benefit to mankind, that we can control a, a food source. But there's a negative thing expressed too that with the domestication of animals came disease. But eventually we developed immunity. So things like measles comes from the animals, but eventually people became more immune to the diseases coming from the animals. During the Neolithic Revolution, we also see the domestication of crops like rice in China, figs and wheat in the Middle East. Interesting to note, even with these advances in things like irrigation, Early on, life expectancy and health dropped. So 
it's important to try to hypothesize. You know, if people are seeing that they're actually living shorter lives, and they're actually being shorter, if you suggested that the people were six inches shorter in, in statute because of their uh, weaker diets, before the Neolithic Revolution, the diets were primarily protein-based, and now after the Neolithic Revolution, you know, they're depending upon more grains, and therefore their, their growth was stunted by about six inches on average. So the question should be asked in your head, well, why would they have this revolution then? They have shorter lives, they're actually physically becoming weaker. Why did we go from, you know, this Neolithic caveman-like existence to a more civil Neolithic revolution? Because of the Neolithic revolution, because of city building, we do start seeing some social cornerstones. So the economic cornerstones are the domestication of crops and animals, and uh, the division of labor with the economic cornerstones as well. Now with the division of labor, they ended up freeing up, because they invented things like granaries, they freed up time to pursue other, pers other occupations. So other occupations that they might pursue could lead to breakthroughs in technology. So they invent things like the calendar and the wheel, but they also invent weapons, and that'll lead to warfare as city-states will compete for the finite resources with each other. But it'll also lead to advances like art. As a consequence of the division of labor, as a consequence of the economic cornerstones changing, we have a social impact. The birth of social classes. This is a result of economic property ownership. Whose ideas should we promote in these new city-states? Who should we follow? So the Neolithic Revolution is the beginning of some of our cornerstones, and it is a time, like any revolution, of great change. Some of the things we still value today, and some we do not. Moving on, we're going to look at uh, Hammurabi in Babylonia in 1754 BC. Hammurabi creates the, the Code of Hammurabi, Hammurabi's Code. And what this did socially is it set the rules of how we should coexist. What is proper social conduct? What are the acceptable norms that we should adhere to? So as neighbors in a social situation, what's acceptable? This is very significant, very important in 1754's Babylonia because you have people from different tribes moving to the city-state. People of different cultures, different religions, different languages. And therefore they're coming in with different values, different traditions. So the, the government, Hammurabi, needed to establish a code that would govern everyone, regardless of their background. So maybe before you moved into our city-state, you believed that murder was acceptable, and our city-state will practice an eye for an eye, Code 196. So because of the, what we've used today, multicultural nature, but really the, the diversity of the people moving into Hammurabi's state of Babylonia, they needed to create a codification of law. What's acceptable here? Because we have such diversity here, we need to establish the norms. This also announces, in terms of political cornerstones, one of the main things of the government, one of the main purposes of the government, is to set rules. So Hammurabi's code also establishes a political cornerstone of why do we have government? So I began grade, grade nine social studies this year asking the question, you know, why did man invent government? My grade nines were mostly completely lost about that, right? But the idea is, with, with the Neolithic Revolution, why would we invent governments in these city-states? Why would they have government? What's the purpose of government? Hammurabi shows the purpose of government is to establish a code of conduct. So his code is a cornerstone of civilization still today. That's why Hammurabi and some of his code is reflected in Canada's Charter of Rights and Freedoms 
and the legal code in the United States. Hammurabi's code is going to talk about freedom, but it's also going to talk about crime and punishment. If you do this, this is the punishment. And as Hipshus established, some of the punishments were quite absurd. There's an economic cornerstone here as well, because included in Hammurabi's code are ideas like property law and minimum wage. So Hammurabi's code is a cornerstone of the Babylonian city-state and the Babylonian Empire, but it also remains a cornerstone here today. Next up, we could go to ancient Greece. And when we go to ancient Greece, we see more than one, more than one interpretation of how society should be. So we looked at Athens and we looked at Sparta. So politically, the cornerstone of Athens is seen as democracy. But it's a, it's a type of democracy that's worth review. So the Athenian democracy, based on rule by all, all citizens that is, and citizens was mostly a, a male gender dominated definition, and you had to be Athenian born and, and own of property, but there are some neat things nonetheless. Athenian democracy was based on participation. One of the flaws of democracy in Canada and the United States today would be the lack of citizen involvement, lack of opportunity for us to get involved in politics. Where's my entry point? Other than voting, how do I get involved? How can I shape the government? So in ancient Athens, they had other recipes for direct democracy, including something called sortition, where you could be chosen randomly by lottery, sorted by lot to serve the city-state in different government positions. There's also direct democracy because anyone who wishes is the policy there. Anyone who wishes could attend the General Assembly. If I wanted to go and sit with the House of Commons, I may be disallowed, right? And I certainly wouldn't be able to propose laws and speak directly to the Prime Minister and try to hold the government and the Prime Minister accountable. But in ancient Athens, any citizen, anyone who wishes, could attend the General Assembly, propose laws, and address each other. So you could argue there's greater accountability in ancient Athens and greater opportunity for true democracy, rule by the people for the people. So cornerstone in Athens was democracy, rule by the people. One of the assumptions is that the crowd has wisdom. So not everybody agrees with the Athenians that the crowd has wisdom, including some of the more famous Athenians, like Plato himself, who valued the oligarchy system that was more common in Sparta. Before we get to Sparta culturally, the Athenians could be seen as a city-state that again was male-centered. Daughters were seen as a liability. The Athenians would also be seen as a city-state where the citizens had a duty to participate in politics. So there is some values that overlap with Canada today, and there may be some values that you would wish Canada could outgrow. Moving a little further south down the Greek peninsula, we run into the city-state of Sparta that uh, unfortunately doesn't exist anymore. You go to Greece, you can't find Sparta. The city has been basically decimated. Whereas Athens is a great city, right? So Sparta was built on the idea of rule by the few by the best. So there's a nice contrast, a nice contrasting assumption or value with the Athenians. The Athenians, their cornerstone is rule by all. Let's promote all. The Spartans are no, let's rule by the few the best. Interesting to note though, that in Sparta, gender did play a role. The men were the warriors, therefore government needed to be 
more of a female occupation because if the men are away, then who's running the affairs of your city state? So the Spartan women, even though they're not living in a democracy, they're living in an oligarchy, the Spartan women may be allotted greater opportunities than their counterparts in Athens. So Spartan women may be put in positions of political authority and power where Athenian women may not. The Spartans and the Athenians are both trying to create an ideal state. And as mentioned before, Plato did agree with some of what Sparta was doing. He thought that a small elite class of philosopher kings may be best able to rule, rule the city-state, to create a true republic. So the Spartans, their value is sacrifice for the state. Rather than individualism, like maybe the, the Athenians have freedoms to protect the individuals in Athens, the Spartans live for each other, for the glory of the state. Those are most of our notes on the Greeks. In terms of religion, it is interesting to note that the Athenians were still doing animal sacrifices. So, much like the Romans that we're going to visit next, the Athenians, uh, many of the Athenian families might have their own temples or shrines, and at that they might offer sacrifices so to get the gods, the gods' grace. So religiously, moving on to the Romans, uh, depending upon your wealth, the wealthier you are as a family, the more um, the more extravagant your shrine, your family shrine might be. But you definitely try to get the favor of the gods. So you, you try to get the favor of the gods by offering them sacrifices or offering them stuff for their glory like wealth. So the Roman case study is, is fairly interesting. And you're going to see a lot of differences in terms of gender roles. One of the main things that we're seeing here is that the boys and the men are being promoted and the women are not. One of the things that I found most interesting from the video was their names alone. That the one family had multiple daughters and the father just called them all by the same name. So that they're easy to forget. Historically, Roman women are easy to forget because they have names that are hard to distinguish from each other. Whereas the boys that are born, their names will show their lineage, their connection with history. Rome was desiring to be an eternal city. They wanted the empire to last forever. But they thought it was through the boys and through the men that they could achieve that, through their connection with their ancestors. So we saw that the dad would take his son and they would go and visit some art galleries and they would see the history and the glory that they have shared as Roman people as they try to pass that glory to the next generation. But we also saw that the boys were still controlled up to the age of 25 economically, that the boys would have to, if they're entering into contracts, they'd have to enter it in with the uh, ward of someone older we also saw, see lots of different classes, so in terms of the social uh, cornerstones in Rome. We've already talked about how women would be separated from the men. Even in the public baths, for the most part of Roman history, they were not going to the public bath at the same time. Rome had different neighborhoods. I want to say it's a city of seven hills. It's a, a city of several hills. I think it is seven. And some of the areas have wealthier neighborhoods than others. And uh, what we saw in the video is depending upon your wealth, you're definitely going to have a different lifestyle. So um, there's a city-state based on slavery. And the slaves are there to work hard. And if they ended up not doing as the master wishes, the master has the obligation, the ability to beat the slaves. And it was very punishing, very vicious. Now, some slaves were referred to as freedmen because the slave owner could decide to free the slave. But even having the term freedmen announces to the, those who they interact with, this is a recently free person. 
They weren't born free, so they don't have quite the same status, social status, as other Roman citizens. Culturally, Rome was known for lots of public festivals and celebrations, but at these festivals and celebrations, most women wouldn't have positions of privilege. That they may be viewing it from the upper decks, unless they're the Vestal Virgins, they're not going to be on display. So in summary, in Rome, we see the desire for greatness and glory and eternity, but within that we see a city-state and ultimately an empire based upon very clear gender roles. When we went to Egypt, we see that same story of gender roles, that there was that one pharaoh that was a woman, that uh, 20 years after her reign, they ended up trying to erase her from history. And the whole point was that the pharaoh is the earthly version of a male god, and therefore it was unacceptable for the pharaoh to be a female. So we still have in ancient Egypt now, in terms of culture, we have a culture that had clear gender definitions. Much like Rome socially, Egypt had servants, now in Rome, we talked about how the slaves could be beaten. In Egypt, the servants may be buried alive with their masters. Although the servants uh, did believe in the afterlife, still looking in hindsight, this is a practice that does seem to be a strange tradition from the position of 2020. Politically in Egypt, the Pharaoh, the manifestation of God here on earth, would have tremendous power, but at the same time, there is a class of oracles that, because of their elevated position and their relationship with the gods, they, within society, had greater social status because of their connection with the gods. There were some interesting notes about the executive branch of the government under Egypt. For example, they talked about how the police could beat confessions out of the people. They talked about how in Egypt you were guilty until proven innocent. And that they had the death penalty. And although the death penalty at times wasn't practiced as much, most specifically the death penalty overlaps the politics with the culture and religion that you could be burnt alive if you had offended the sun god, their main god. One last thing that we could look at with the Egyptians is the whole idea of mummification and how something that becomes a cornerstone may end up, you know, throughout history being redefined. So the redefinition of mummification was shown in the video as we learn that later on, in the 16th century, in Europe, Europeans felt that if they would eat a part of the, the mummy, that it would actually make them healthier. So you can see how something that was a cornerstone ends up kind of being redefined, and in, in this case, in a very dark way. I guess one thing that I, I forgot to mention from Rome, and uh, I really wish I had, is going back to Rome and culturally, other than the arranged marriages that they had, uh, when the boys were done from the bath of the day, they went back to the house and they, and they had a very um, communal dinner with the other men. And it was a point to eat and then drink to the point of vomiting. And uh, as a final note, there would be a special room in their great houses called a vomitorium. And that would be where they'd go to vomit after they ate so that they could go back and eat some more. And this shows just how much pleasure, the value of, of having pleasure in their lives was for the Romans. That they wanted to be able to eat and drink so much that they had a special place so that they could expel some of that so they could go and eat and drink some more. So for the rich men of Rome, their lives were about their pleasure, about their own glory as well. So that's a quick look at some of the cornerstones that we saw in the ancient global world. Now you have an activity, 
And I'd like you to kind of look at everything we just talked about and saw this morning and pick three. Pick three cornerstones for your society. So don't pick three economic, one, two, three, and all, they're all just economic. Try to have at least two of the circles included. And there's some things that uh, we saw before the video, like it was suggested that you know maybe money is the greatest cornerstone or the calendar is the greatest cornerstone. I want you to pick three. Pick three that you believe would be the cornerstones of a society you'd want to live in and explain why you picked those three. And unfortunately, that's probably all we're going to get to today. So I wanted to get started on some stuff for tomorrow to get it preloaded a little bit, but we can, we got lots of time. So the assignment to wrap up class today is just pick three of those cornerstones and describe why they in your mind, all are the ultimate foundation of a ideal society. That if you take those things away, like that one guy said, you can't take away your freedom of speech. So what are the cornerstones that if you remove them, society will crumble?